welcome to this episode of The Square. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the psychology of establishing trust and what that looks like as people start to transition from a work from home environment back into an office environment. Today I'm joined by Jacqueline Hunter who is a project design manager on the interiors team and we're really excited to have Jane Hensley who is a licensed clinician who works in and private practice in the area, but also has a background in change management and crisis work. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Well, so Jane, let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, trust is essential for employees, obviously. Um, can you kind of elaborate a little bit on some of the key factors that are involved in, in establishing a foundation of trust? Absolutely. Um, you know, Trust, I think, is important in basically any human relationship ever. Work, personal, um, at the gym, you know, any, everywhere we go, we need trust. It's a, it's a prerequisite for a relationship in a lot of ways. And so I think it's important to start with a really um, solid definition of trust. And so Charles Feltman, who is really an a eminent leadership coach in the areas of trust, says that choosing trust is choosing to make something important to you vulnerable to the actions of someone else. Um, and so I think that this is really huge, you know, in our post 9-11 era, because I'm, I, I personally cannot think of a time when we collectively as a country and maybe even globally have felt more vulnerable. Um, and so, not only are we all kind of raw and feeling very vulnerable, we're now asking people to kind of come out of their shells and come out of their homes. Um, and so trust is really a compounded experience. Um, John Gottman, a really notable psychologist and researcher in this area, prolific amounts of research on trust, says that trust is really built in the smallest of moments, in the very small moments. And you can think of those times in your life, in your personal life, and then certainly at work. Um, and there are a lot of distinctions around trust. So trust is really, if we get down to it, a notable umbrella term for a lot of key factors in relationship. And we could go on and on and have a five day conversation about it. But I think the ones that are important to think about right now, um, as you're an employer going back to work and asking your employees to come back in eventually, and as you're an employee going back, um, I think the first one to think about is boundaries, um, both seen and unseen. And you guys are really the experts in talking about um, seen, beautiful, healthy boundaries. And um, I talk a lot about those boundaries that are unseen. Um, a lot about accountability is another distinction that we want to think about. And that's the idea that when you make a mistake, you own it and you apologize for it and make things right. Um, I suspect that a lot of mistakes have been made within enterprises and organizations and that they will continue to be made. Um, so acknowledging that trust helps people forgive you quickly. Um, reliability. You say you're gonna do you're gonna do what you said you were gonna do, um, and then non-judgment. We both allow each other to struggle or makes or make mistakes without judgment. And so, I think we have all been struggling in different ways in our private lives and in our professional lives. And thinking about boundaries, I think that those have really um, blurred more than they ever have before um, recently because we've all been working from home. And so I think that when we talk about trust, it's important to remember that there's a lot of qualities that um, build trust. And it's not that you can't have one without the other, and it's not trust versus distrust, but it's when you think about the compounding factors of trust, if you can kind of identify one piece of trust that might be missing, maybe you can rebuild and restore eventually. So Jane, to that end, and, and I love what you said about boundaries and accountability. I think there's, there's some of those unseen boundaries and accountability that we just kind of took for granted at work before and that COVID has kind of brought into stark contrast and focus. Um, Jacqueline, what are some of those things that you think we took for granted in terms of health and wellness when it comes to the work environment that now all of a sudden we're having to think a lot about? 
I think there's been a lot more awareness um, when it comes to this idea of connection, um, social connection, when it, in regards to our mental wellness. Um, I think more and more of us are acknowledging that as you just see people reaching out to connect to one another in different avenues, in different ways. Um, you know, the office has, has usually been a platform for a lot of people for, for those areas um, of reconnection. And so I think, I think, you know, at least my experience working remotely, I'm just craving that, that reconnection with others. Um, and I think a lot of other people are feeling the same way. Um, another thing is just like the physical interaction that, that you're used to receiving. Um, right now we're kind of tethered. A lot of us are tethered to our computers. And so our work day from, you know, our typical work day looks totally different. Um, and we're not getting that physical movement um, that we're used to in that interaction with people. Uh, so I think th those are really important to consider. Um, and then lastly, just ergonomic design. I mean, that's something that we as designers strategically integrate into the workplace just inherently as a baseline. So, you know, when you're thinking about the lighting and the foot candles that, that lay on the desk and how that impacts your, your mental, mental um, focus, and kind of the blue light that you're exposed to, things like that that you may not be reconsidering when you're in your home office. The furniture that's arranged, you know, where you're sitting. A lot of us are just kind of on the couch or in a lounge chair where, where there are furniture designers who really spend their, their entire, you know, development and product development around the ergonomics of, of how your body kind of conforms to these, these parts and pieces. Um, you know, things such as, the technology, I feel like I've, oh, that's a challenge for me all the time. Just having the support of, of technology that your office typically offers is, is usually um, a huge, at least nowadays, I feel like we're, we're all feeling that, um, how, it could, how it could vary. And then, you know, things such as acoustics. You know, I've got a two-year-old that's constantly running around, and I know a lot of people are in similar situations. So just... Having, having thoughtful design um, in an office can, that can really support your, your wellness, and it's not always apparent. You know, those are things that are really integrated into the space um, that's not necessarily reflected in kind of your home environment. So Jane, what are some of the boundaries that we need to be keeping in mind? You know, certainly we were forced into a position of thinking through boundaries. The first two weeks that I was home, I was basically tethered to the computer and, and didn't take advantage of the fact that I was at home and didn't have a two hour round trip commute and could spend that extra time with the kids and whatnot. And so that happened and we kind of felt our way through some of that. What are some of the boundaries we'll need to kind of feel our way through as we head back to the office? Yeah, um, this has really forced us companies and individuals, I think, to lean into flexibility in a way that we never have really been forced to before. Um, and I love that example you used of you lost your commute and then gained some time back with your family, and but you felt because your office was physically right there, you felt the need to be working all the time. I experienced the same thing. Um, and my husband did as well, who also has about a two hour commute every day. And um, so we, we actually ended up getting used to kind of being around each other a lot more than we were. And he's actually gone back this week and there was a struggle with, man, I'm really gonna miss you. Um, and so there was a long conversation between the two of us about we really discovered some things that we appreciated that we didn't even really realize we were missing um, in our family lives. And we've got to realize that a lot of other people have, are going through that. And maybe not necessarily that being home all the time was a positive experience for them too. Um, I've been kind of using this metaphor of, we've all been on this quarantine staycation and together but separately and you know we don't know what baggage or souvenirs we're going to bring back to the office my souvenirs and baggage is going to look a lot different than yours and you might be really excited to show some of it off and i might not be so excited about it and so i think when we think about boundaries and flexibility from an employer's perspective um, We've got to be really patient with each other and with, with ourselves and realizing that we've 
been through and are still going through something pretty stressful. Um, and I've, I refer to it as kind of a peripheral stress. Um, it's not directly in your face all the time, um, but it is stress and fear and uncertainty. And um, so we're all, we're all dying to get back to some sort of future, new normal, whatever you want to call it, but also realizing that it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time and we've got to be really flexible and, and patient with each other. So Jacqueline, what does that look like um, as we go back into the environment and we're in a physical space and as we're thinking through design for workplace? How does that, how do we learn from this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I kind of want to tie back to what Jane was saying about fear and uncertainty. Um, I think it's really important for employers to really acknowledge um, that people are sensitive right now. And, and we're looking to the employers for these answers and to be providing um, kind of solutions or guidance um, within the built space that can help us feel safe when coming back to work. So um, I, I've, I've heard it kind of talked about in a couple different ways, um, one of which is kind of looking at the short-term implications. And those are things that we're already starting to see, at least in retail environments, um, you're seeing kind of this manipulation of circulation paths and, and informative signage to help people fill in the blanks and not have that fear and uncertainty. They know that this is being addressed. Um, you know, strategic planning ideas and, and kind of spreading people out so that they feel safe to be in an environment. But then the long-term implications, at least from a built space and a design perspective, um, you know, that could be looking at is there going to be an increase in, you know, monumental stair design because we're encouraging that stair walking and that social distancing? Or are we looking at more touchless processing systems? Um, you know, the idea of gestural technology has, has existed for a while now, but now it's almost been, um, I think, I, I foresee it being kind of expedited and people just grasping onto that and making sure that everything else, we're looking at things through a different lens now. And we need to be, as employers, we need to be kind of set that boundary and that tone and say, we're going to take care of you guys and here's how we're reacting to it. Um, you know, we, we have a couple different sectors at Corgan and one of which is healthcare and they've, this is part of their baseline. I mean, healthcare design already has kind of all of these stipulations um, to help prevent and keep patients safe. And so a lot of those things are going to start trickling into the workplace design as well. Um, you know, finishes, things along those lines. So I think there's a lot of different implications that this pandemic is alluding to. So we've talked a little bit about the built environment and, and kind of people's mindsets. But I know one of the things that I've heard a lot about is um, what can companies do to restore trust, which is is kind of funny to me because it, it, the companies, despite, you know, always being able to handle the situation a little bit better, like you mentioned, Jane, that for once the companies aren't to blame, right? They haven't betrayed trust. <laughs> it, it's not, COVID's not their fault, but there is still this element of, of them feeling the responsibility or the weight of restoring trust. Tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think before this started and, you know, this, this, this situation, Trust was already kind of eroding culturally, I think. Fear has started to kind of prevail. Um, mm -hmm. And what I would love to see are the leaders at different organizations um, to lead, lead through fear. I mean, excuse me, lead through <laughs> trust as opposed to leading through fear. Um, and I think that that can really instill a lot of faith. Um, and of course, open and transparent communication um, and going back to those tenants of trust that I mentioned earlier, you know, um, if you're open and transparent, then people are more likely to forgive you when you screw up, right? Because someone's yeah. going to screw up along the way. Um, and um, there's no one way to communicate trust in this situation. I think it's really important to consider your own workplace culture, consider perhaps how information moves among employees. And, um, you know, remember that trust is exponentially much harder um, because of where we're already where we were and where we're going. Um, and so I think it's helpful to communicate about how you're making decisions, right? 
So are you following local guidelines? Are you following CDC guidelines? Are you listening to the federal government? Do you have your own committee? Do you have your own Dr. Fauci, if you will? Do you have your own medical expert you're consulting with? Um, if you don't necessarily work at a place that requires your bottom in that chair, maybe talking to people about why you want some of them back in the office. And then again, flexibility. Perhaps it's a phased approach. Um, and then one thing that I think would be really helpful is remembering that now, especially with this really blurred boundary between work and home life that we are, we're all kind of starting to shake ourselves loose of, um, when we go to our office and we come home, we are sharing where we've been with the people we live with. And I think that that um, could potentially create even more fear and uncertainty, not only for the employee or the individual, but for their family. And so in terms of open and um, transparent communication, I think it's important that companies figure out a way to talk to um, their employees' families. Um, maybe they send a video about what the office and workplace is going to look like so that I know that when um, my family member goes off, I know what it looks like when they get there. Um, maybe they film cleaning practices and share all that information, um, not just with employees, but directed more towards um, their families and get involved that way. And that's awesome. I'd I know that uh, you know I've I have friends and family members. Some of the companies have been super proactive. They have really to that transparency you were talking about. Really, almost over communicated. You know, they've had weekly updates. I know that something's happened at Corgan. We've heard weekly from the the um, executive committee, and and really feel that there is a um, a uh, a transparency there. And then I've heard from somewhere they've just been like completely in the dark they'll occasionally get an email and and just their feeling about work regardless of industry is really radically different between those two extremes so uh, I, communication i definitely see how that that could play a key role in building trust so to that communication you know there's still a lot of uncertainty even for employers right they don't have a magic eight ball that can tell them what's going to happen in the future so when you're trying to communicate clearly and and be open how do you handle the uncertainty of not knowing you know, what's coming and, and, and necessarily having all the answers? Absolutely. You know, I think that when you don't know an answer as a leader or as the leader of a team, it's okay to say, you know, we're, we don't know, um, but we're doing everything we can to get the right information and listen to the science and listen to, to the right experts. Um, Another tool that we should think about using when we're talking to our employees always, but especially right now, is empathy, right? Again, thinking about what quarantine staycation baggage everyone is bringing back to their office and remembering that we all have access to a lot of the same information now. And my information is likely not the same as someone else's information and the way I filter it and the way I read it. And so realizing that um, you know employees are going to have questions, they're going to be listening a lot, but you have also got to start listening back as a leader and as an organization. Jacqueline, are there things that we can do in design and in the built environment that um, promote that openness and that that uh, communication? Yeah, absolutely. I think Jane, you hit the nail on the head um, when it came when it comes to kind of that workplace um, change management strategy. I mean, people. People are going to fill in the blanks if they don't have the answer. Um, that's just kind of how humans work, right? So I think from a built perspective, you know, if, if we take strategies as employers to kind of have visible components, um, for instance, you know, you've seen the sanitation stations throughout the spaces. Now, typically we would conceal those because they're not the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, however, now, now our mindsets have shifted, so we may just want to kind of re-emphasize those, those components and let people know, kind of give them information and feed them that information. Um, you mentioned kind of over-communicate, and I think that, could, that, that doesn't hurt. I mean, that just kind of helps people understand what's happening in the background. Um, ways that we've seen that also done is just through guided signage. Um, that's an easy solution that we can see, I mean, just things that can promote a culture of hygiene. So like, you, I loved your example, Jane, about kind of filming the cleaning crew and kind of sending that off to the family. 
because that's just acknowledging that you guys care about your employees enough to reach out to the extended family and you care enough about their wellness and their family's wellness uh, that you're willing to share kind of these internal insights that would or kind of take the extra step to do that. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, I think as, as far as just looking at, you know, the finish applications and things like that, um, you know, there is a perception behind things um, when it comes to the built space. So there was, there's an example um, that our healthcare team has provided before about, there was a case study where they had a hospital um, that had kept getting complaints from patients and really terrible reviews um, and ultimately saying that the space was just non-clean, you know, it wasn't clean enough for them. They felt like there was infection, things along those lines. Uh, in the end, it just came down to the perception of the finishes that were applied. Uh, they, they were very dark and warm and speckly. So they ended up, the company acknowledged that and they renovated the space gave everything very clean, kind of sterile look so that it looked a little bit more durable and cleanable and made the people feel safe in that environment. And it was just a perception. So I think that's kind of an interesting mindset too and perspective to acknowledge from an employer standpoint. It's it's interesting. You know, I, I, I'm curious because we have talked a lot about the employer, Jane, but trust is really a two-way street. What, what is the employee's kind of responsibility when it comes to trust and building that trust as we move back to the workplace? You know, when we think about trust, we think about trusting other people. Um, but when you come and sit in my office, the first thing we're going to talk about is, do you trust yourself? Um, and again, we could go off on that if we needed to, but, um, you know, Distrust, a, sign, a really strong sign of distrust, and we've all been there at some point in our lives in some relationship where you have someone continually checking up on you. Are you doing your work? Did you do it right? Um, and then, of course, you have someone who might be withholding information from you. That can be a sign of distrust. And um, so in thinking about trust being a two-way street, You've got to really communicate to your employees that um, you know that they're exercising personal responsibility, right? And then um, that they feel empowered to make those responsible choices on their own without being told constantly about what their responsibility is, right? And so we're talking a lot about over communicating, but we're also saying you need to communicate personal responsibility and know that people have autonomy and that they're gonna make the right choices. Um, so that's a really fine line and that, that's a skilled um, piece of communication. But I think when you kind of, again, when you step back from that place of empathy and thinking about where people are, meeting them where they are, really um, taking stock of your company's culture, that it can be achieved. You, you know, one thing, again, kind of fleshing out the idea of communicating, and Jacqueline, you mentioned change management. Um, it's it, There's a real opportunity here, right, for companies. It's either going to be one of those situations where traditionally you've said the employee is important, and now you're getting the opportunity to show that because actions speak louder than words. You're going to have to kind of put... Your, your money where your mouth is in terms of making that a priority, or you're going to be shown very clearly that it's not a priority for you and you won't have to worry about anybody thinking it might be. Um, but a lot of that's going to come down to change management and really doing that well is, is how you communicate. What does that look like? Because I think typically we think of change management as something that is centered around a building change or, or something that we have a lot of control over. How does that change management happen when it's something like a pandemic that we don't have control over. I would just say over the communication tool is key. I mean, having a strategy about how we're going to send the message at the right time, because that's another part of it is, you know, there's this there's this change curve that happens um, in any sort of change, whether it's a big move or, you know, something crazy like this you're still kind of hitting all of those same sorts of um, checklists where people have to adopt what's happening and then they kind of are on board and everybody moves down up and down this curve at a different path. So I think um, just as far as 
you know, how that looks as far as output goes. Um, it's really just being aware and getting your, your employer kind of engaged, you know, whether it's a representative from HR and IT and your, you know, legal team and just kind of representatives from all different departments so that there's a voice that's heard from different perspectives and then understanding, okay, what's the message that we're trying to send here to help establish trust and, and make people feel comfortable coming back to the office and feeling safe and, and well and promoting that wellness. So Jacqueline, when we are thinking through what Jana said about setting boundaries and, and even though those may be a little bit more conceptual or, or emotional, what, what do those look like in a physical space? How does that influence design in the future? That's a great question, Brandon. Um, I think, you know, we have to be acknowledging, we have to acknowledge that you have to trust one another. And part of that is providing employee choice. Um, so we've already kind of started to see that in spaces, for instance, large kind of work cafe environments that encourage people to go there and use it throughout the day at their leisure. And your primary manager may not be aware that you're there, but I think that just reinforces the layer of connection and communication that you have to have in the workplace. Um, but it also establishes and reinforces, you know, people's trust in the space. You know, they know, okay, I'm going here to get this certain task done, um, and I have the ability to make that decision to do so. So I feel like some of the types of spaces that we're going to start seeing um, as just a baseline in our designs will, will replicate kind of these opportunities for people to kind of lure them into different areas and make this, the office more of a magnetic space for community and, and people are excited to go there. They're going there to get, you know, to have that reconnection, but also to, you know, we're all adults here. They're, com they're coming to get the job done and, and I think the office is a perfect platform for that. You know, Jacqueline, that's so interesting. I really wanted to add that what you guys do are um, design in a way that a lot of people don't normally think about. And so you're mentioning all of these things like lighting and the way a chair is contoured. These are not things that I and a lot of people I know think about, but they are um, inherently communicating and building trust within an environment. Um, you know, you're building trust without people really even knowing it. And what I know about trust is that it is infectious, just like fear and anxiety is infectious. Um, an incredibly important piece of being human is that we're building trust and that it's, um, it's infectious among all of us. And so if your environment is an inherently, you know, trustworthy environment where you sit, what you see, where you're working, um, that's going to be huge for a lot of people. Um, and I think it's awesome to kind of hear those things because you're speaking a language that um, I, I've never heard before. Well, on that, I think we'll wrap it up. I really appreciate you both joining us. Thank you so much for um, you know, giving us the benefit of your experience and insight. Um, if you have any questions for either Jacqueline or Jane, we're going to list their information in the description below. Um, and we hope that as uh, you know, your company may begin a transition back into their workspace, that uh, you're safe and that that trust begins to build with your employer. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Square, and we'll see you next time.